Madret Familiar. I hope everyone's having a wonderful week, and that you're not miserably dripping the last vestiges of moisture from every pore as you sit in a sweltering, uncooled room on the fourth floor. As much as I don't enjoy it, because only a precious few homes have air conditioning here in the Pacific Northwest, it has been rather inspiring in the reading of tonight's story. I am recording this intro with the windows open and the fans on, so please excuse the slightly noisy recording. As always, I appreciate everyone who listens, and I appreciate everyone who has contributed to the show. If you have a story you would like to be considered to be read on the show, or if you would like to read a story, please send your story or voice auditions to submissions at thedreadfamiliar.com. I'm doing one more episode this season, which will conclude tonight's story, and then I'll be taking some time off to gather uh, new stories for season two. So this is a perfect time to submit, and you can find more details at thedreadfamiliar.com. So far, this podcast has featured one story by and another story inspired by H.P. Lovecraft. The latter story was inspired by The Dreams in the Witch House, which is going to follow as tonight's reading. First, however, as I mentioned back in the first episode of the show, I would like to take a minute to address the author's views and beliefs which do unfortunately find their way into his stories. To be blunt about it, Lovecraft was a racist and a xenophobe. I want to be clear that I make no excuses for his beliefs, and I fully disagree with these sentiments. I continue to feature his works on my show for two reasons. First, despite these things, he wrote stories that push the boundaries of where a horror story can take us. Cosmic horror, as it came to be known, was largely his own invention, so in spite of some of his prejudices being evident in his writing, he taps into a region of fear that I personally find very intriguing. Second, and most importantly, I believe that we can't move forward and overcome racism and xenophobia without addressing straight on the fact that they exist. Pretending Lovecraft's contributions to fiction don't exist because of his terrible worldview would not help anyone to address that viewpoint and to see how truly horrible it is. My hope is that these stories can be viewed from the perspective that I have chosen to read them from, which is that the mind of someone living in fear of their own neighbor because of that person's color or national origin, is truly horrifying, rather than, as he calls them, a dusky-looking person being horrifying. So, with that said, this is the first half of The Dreams in the Witch House. Whether the dreams brought on the fever, or the fever brought on the dreams, Walter Gilman did not know. Behind everything crouched the brooding, festering horror of the ancient town, and of the moldy, unhallowed garret table where he wrote and studied, and wrestled with figures and formulae when he was not tossing on the meager iron bed. His ears were growing sensitive to a preternatural and intolerable degree, and he had long ago stopped the cheap mantle clock whose ticking had come to seem like a thunder of artillery. At night, the subtle stirring of the black city outside, the sinister scurrying of rats in the wormy partitions, and the creaking of hidden timbers in the sentried house were enough to give him a sense of strident pandemonium. The darkness always teemed with unexplained sound, and yet he sometimes shook with fear lest the noises he heard should subside and allow him to hear certain other, fainter noises, which he suspected were lurking behind them. He was in the changeless, legend-haunted city of Arkham, with its clustering gambrel roofs that sway and sag over attics, where witches hid from the king's men in the dark, olden years of the province. 
nor was any spot in that city more steeped in macabre memory than the gable room which harbored him. For it was this house and this room which had likewise harbored old Keziah Mason, whose flight from Salem Jail at the last no one was ever able to explain. That was in 1692. The jailer had gone mad and babbled of a small, white-fanged, furry thing, which scuttled out of Keziah's cell, and not even Cotton Mather could explain the curves and angles smeared on the gray stone walls with some red, sticky fluid. Possibly, Gilman ought not to have studied so hard. Non-Euclidean calculus and quantum physics are enough to stretch any brain, and when one mixes them with folklore and tries to trace a strange background of multidimensional reality behind the ghoulish hints of the gothic tales and the wild whispers of the chimney corner, one can hardly expect to be wholly free from mental tension. Gilman came from Haverhill, but it was only after he had entered college in Arkham that he began to connect his mathematics with the fantastic legends of elder magic. Something in the air of the hoary town worked obscurely on his imagination. The professors at Miskatonic had urged him to slacken up, and had voluntarily cut down his course at several points. Moreover, they had stopped him from consulting the dubious old books on forbidden secrets that were kept under lock and key in a vault at the university library. But all these precautions came late in the day, so that Gilman had some terrible hints of the dreaded Necronomicon of Abdul al azrid the fragmentary Book of Ibon, and the suppressed von unaussprechlichen Kulten of von Junst to correlate with his abstract formulae on the properties of space and the linkage of dimensions known and unknown. He knew his room was in the old witch house. That, indeed, was why he had taken it. There was much in the Essex County record about Keziah Mason's trial, and what she had admitted under pressure to the court of Oyer and Terminer had fascinated Gilman beyond all reason. She had told Judge Hawthorne of lines and curves that could be made to point out directions leading through the walls of space to other spaces beyond, and had implied that such lines and curves were frequently used at certain midnight meetings in the dark valley of the White Stone beyond Meadow Hill and on the unpeopled island in the river. She had spoken also of the black man, of her oath, and of her new secret name, Nahab. Then she had drawn those devices on the walls of her cell and vanished. Gilman had believed strange things about Keziah and had felt a queer thrill on learning that her dwelling was still standing after more than 235 years. When he heard the hushed Arkham whispers about Keziah's persistent presence in the old house and the narrow streets, about the irregular human tooth marks left on certain sleepers in that and other houses, about the childish cries heard near May Eve and Hallow Mass, about the stench often noted in the old house's attic just after those dreaded seasons, and about the small, furry, sharp-toothed thing which haunted the moldering structure in the town and nuzzled people curiously in the black hours before dawn. He resolved to live in the place at any cost. A room was easy to secure, for the house was unpopular, hard to rent, and long given over to cheap lodgings. Gilman could not have told what he expected to find there, but he knew he wanted to be in the building where some circumstance had more or less suddenly given a mediocre old woman of the 17th century an insight into mathematical depths, perhaps beyond the utmost modern delvings of Planck, Heisenberg, Einstein, and de Sitter. He studied the timber and plaster walls for traces of cryptic designs at every accessible spot where the paper had peeled, and within a week managed to get the eastern attic room where Keziah was held to have practiced her spells. 
It had been vacant from the first, for no one had ever been willing to stay there long, but the Polish landlord had grown wary about renting it. Yet nothing whatever happened to Gilman till about the time of the fever. No ghostly Kazaya flitted through the somber halls and chambers. No small furry thing crept into his dismal eyrie to nuzzle him, and no record of the witch's incantations rewarded his constant search. Sometimes he would take walks through the shadowy tangles of unpaved, musty-smelling lanes where eldritch brown houses of unknown age leaned and tottered and leered mockingly through narrow, small-paned windows. Here he knew strange things had happened once. There was a faint suggestion behind the surface that everything of that monstrous past might not, at least in the darkest, narrowest, and most intricately crooked alleys, have utterly perished. He also rode out twice to the ill-regarded island in the river, and made a sketch of the singular angles described by the moss-grown rows of grey standing stones, whose origin was so obscure and immemorial. Gilman's room was of good size, but queerly irregular shape. The north wall slating perceptibly inward from the outer to the inner end, while the low ceiling slanted gently downward in the same direction. Aside from an obvious rat hole and the signs of other stopped-up ones, there was no access, nor any appearance of a former avenue of access, to the space which must have existed between the slanting wall and the straight outer wall on the house's north side, though a view from the exterior showed where a window had been boarded up at a very remote date. The loft above the ceiling, which must have had a slanting floor, was likewise inaccessible. When Gilman climbed up a ladder to the cobwebbed level loft above the rest of the attic, he found vestiges of a bygone aperture, tightly and heavily covered with ancient planking and secured by the stout wooden pegs common in colonial carpentry. No amount of persuasion, however, could induce the stolid landlord to let him investigate either of these two closed spaces. As time wore along, his absorption in the irregular wall and ceiling of his room increased, for he began to read into the odd angles a mathematical significance which seemed to offer vague clues regarding their purpose. Old Kazaya, he reflected, might have had excellent reasons for living in a room with peculiar angles, for was it not through certain angles that she claimed to have gone outside the boundaries of the world of space we know? His interest gradually veered away from the unplumbed voids beyond the slanting surfaces, since it now appeared that the purpose of those surfaces concerned the side he was on. The touch of brain fever and the dreams began early in February. For some time, apparently, the curious angles of Gilman's room had been having a strange, almost hypnotic effect on him. And as the bleak winter advanced, he had found himself staring more and more intently at the corner where the down-slanting ceiling met the inward-slanting wall. About this period, his inability to concentrate on his formal studies worried him considerably, his apprehensions about the mid-year examinations being very acute. But the exaggerated sense of bearing was scarcely less annoying. Life had become an insistent and almost unendurable cacophony, and there was that constant, terrifying impression of other sounds, perhaps from regions beyond life, trembling on the very brink of audibility. So far as concrete noises went, the rats in the ancient partitions were the worst. Sometimes their scratching seemed not only furtive, but deliberate. When it came from beyond the slanting north wall, it was mixed with a sort of dry rattling. And when it came from the century-closed loft above the slanting ceiling, Gilman always braced himself as if expecting some horror, which only bided its time before descending to engulf him utterly. The dreams were wholly beyond the pale of sanity, and Gilman felt that they must be a result jointly of his studies in mathematics and in folklore. 
He had been thinking too much about the vague regions in which his formulae told him he must lie beyond the three dimensions we know, and about the possibility that old Keziah Mason, guided by some influence past all conjecture, had actually found the gate to those regions. The yellowed country records containing her testimony and that of her accusers were so damnably suggestive of things beyond human experience and the descriptions of the darting little furry object which served as her familiar were so painfully realistic despite their incredible details. That object, no larger than a good-sized rat, and quaintly called by the townspeople Brown Jenkin, seemed to have been the fruit of a remarkable case of sympathetic herd delusion, for in 1692 no less than eleven persons had testified to glimpsing it. There were recent rumors, too, with a baffling and disconcerting amount of agreement. Witnesses said it had long hair in the shape of a rat, but that its sharp-toothed, bearded face was evilly human, while its paws were like tiny human hands. It took messages betwixt old Keziah and the devil, and was nursed on the witch's blood which it sucked like a vampire. Its voice was a kind of loathsome titter, and it could speak all languages. Of all the bizarre monstrosities in Gilman's dreams, nothing filled him with greater panic and nausea than this blasphemous and diminutive hybrid whose image flitted across his vision in a form a thousandfold more hateful than anything his waking mind had deduced from the ancient records and the modern whispers. Gilman's dreams consisted largely in plunges through limitless abysses of inexplicably colored twilight and bafflingly disordered sound, abysses whose material and gravitational properties and whose relation to his own entity he could not even begin to explain. He did not walk or climb, fly or swim, crawl or wriggle, yet always experienced a mode of motion partly voluntary and partly involuntary. Of his own condition he could not well judge, for sight of his arms, legs, and torso seemed always cut off by some odd disarrangement of perspective. But he felt that his physical organization and faculties were somehow marvelously transmuted and obliquely projected, though not without a certain grotesque relationship to his normal proportions and properties. The abysses were by no means vacant, being crowded with indescribably angled masses of alien-hued substance, some of which appeared to be organic while others seemed inorganic. A few of the organic objects tended to awake vague memories in the back of his mind, though he could form no conscious idea of what they mockingly resembled or suggested. In the later dreams, he began to distinguish separate categories into which the organic objects appeared to be divided, and which seemed to involve in each case a radically different species of conduct pattern and basic motivation. Of these categories, one seemed to him to include objects slightly less illogical and irrelevant in their motions than the members of the other categories. All the objects, organic, and inorganic alike, were totally beyond description or even comprehension. Gilman sometimes compared the inorganic matter to prisms, labyrinths, clusters of cubes and planes, and cyclopean buildings, and the organic things struck him variously as groups of bubbles, octopi, centipedes, living Hindu idols, and intricate arabesques roused into a kind of ophidian animation. Everything he saw was unspeakably menacing and horrible, and whenever one of the organic entities appeared by its motions to be noticing him, he felt a stark, hideous fright which generally jolted him awake. Of how the organic entities moved, he could tell no more than of how he moved himself. In time, he observed a further mystery. The tendency of certain entities to appear suddenly out of empty space, or to disappear totally with equal suddenness, 
The shrieking, roaring confusion of sound which permeated the abysses was past all analysis as to pitch, timber, or rhythm, but seemed to be synchronous with vague visual changes in all the indefinite objects, organic and inorganic alike. Yeoman had a constant sense of dread that it might rise to some unbearable degree of intensity during one or another of its obscure, relentlessly inevitable fluctuations. But it was not in one of these vortices of complete alienage that he saw Brown Jenkin. That shocking little horror was reserved for certain lighter, sharper dreams which assailed him just before he dropped into the fullest depths of sleep. He would be lying in the dark fighting to keep awake when a faint lambent glow would gleam to shimmer around the centuried room, showing in a violet mist the convergence of angled planes which had seized his brain so insidiously. The horror would appear to pop out of the rat hole in the corner and patter toward him over the sagging wide planked floor with evil expectancy in its tiny, bearded human face. But mercifully, this dream always melted away before the object got close enough to nuzzle him. It had hellishly long, sharp canine teeth. Gilman tried to stop up the rat hole every day, but each night, the real tenants of the partitions would gnaw away the obstruction, whatever it might be. Once he had the landlord nail a tin over it, but the next night the rats gnawed a fresh hole, in making which they pushed or dragged out into the room a curious little fragment of bone. Gilman did not report his fever to the doctor, for he knew... He could not pass the examinations if ordered to the college infirmary when every moment was needed for cramming. As it was, he failed in calculus D and advanced general psychology, though not without hope of making up the lost ground before the end of the term. It was in March when the fresh element entered his lighter, preliminary dreaming and the nightmare shape of Brown Jenkin began to be accompanied by the nebulous blur, which grew more and more to resemble a bent old woman. This addition disturbed him more than he could account for, but finally he decided that it was like an ancient crone whom he had twice actually encountered in the dark tangle of lanes near the abandoned wharves. On those occasions, the evil, sardonic, and seemingly unmotivated stare of the bell dame had set him almost shivering, especially the first time when an overgrown rat darting across the shadowed mouth of a neighboring alley had made him think irrationally of Brown Jenkin. Now, he reflected, those nervous fears were being mirrored in his disordered dreams. That the influence of the old house was unwholesome, he could not deny but traces of his early morbid interest still held him there. He argued that the fever alone was responsible for his nightly fantasies, and that when the touch abated, he would be free from the monstrous visions. Those visions, however, were of absorbing vividness and convincingness, and whenever he awakened, he retained a vague sense of having undergone much more than he remembered. He was hideously sure that in unrecalled dreams he had talked with both Brown Jenkin and the old woman, and that they had been urging him to go somewhere with them, and to meet a third being of greater potency. Toward the end of March he began to pick up in his mathematics, though the other studies bothered him increasingly. He was getting an intuitive knack for solving Riemannian equations and astonished Professor Upham by his comprehension of fourth-dimensional and other problems which had floored all of the rest of the class. One afternoon, there was a discussion of possible freakish curvatures in space, and of theoretical points of approach or even contact between our part of the cosmos and various other regions as distant as the farthest stars or the transgalactic gulfs themselves, or even as fabulously remote 
as the tentatively conceivable cosmic units beyond the whole Einsteinian space-time continuum. Gilman's handling of this theme filled everyone with admiration, even though some of his hypothetical illustrations caused an increase in the always plentiful gossip about his nervous and solitary eccentricity. What made the students shake their head was his sober theory that a man might, given mathematical knowledge admittedly beyond all likelihood of human acquirement, step deliberately from the earth to any other celestial body which might lie at one of an infinity of specific points in the cosmic pattern. Such a step, he said, would require only two stages. First, a passage out of the three-dimensional sphere we know, and second, a passage back to the three-dimensional sphere at another point, perhaps one of infinite remoteness. That this could be accomplished without loss of life was in many cases conceivable. Any being from any part of three-dimensional space could probably survive in the fourth dimension, and its survival of the second stage would depend upon what alien part of three-dimensional space it might select for its re-entry. Denizens of some planets might be able to live on certain others, even planets belonging to other galaxies or to similar dimensional phases of other space-time continua. Though, of course, there must be vast numbers of mutually uninhabitable, even though mathematically juxtaposed bodies or zones of space. It was also possible that the inhabitants of a given dimensional realm could survive entry to many unknown and incomprehensible realms of additional or indefinitely multiplied dimensions, be they within or outside the given space-time continuum, and that the converse would be likewise true. This was a matter for speculation, though one could be fairly certain that the type of mutation involved in a passage from any given dimensional plane to the next higher one would not be destructive of biological integrity as we understand it. Gilman could not be very clear about his reasons for this last assumption, but his haziness here was more than overbalanced by his clearness on other complex points. Professor Upham especially liked his demonstration of the kinship of higher mathematics to certain phases of magical lore, transmitted down the ages from an ineffable antiquity, human or pre-human whose knowledge of the cosmos and its laws was greater than ours. Around 1st of April, Gilman worried considerably because his slow fever did not abate. He was also troubled by what some of his fellow lodgers said about his sleepwalking. It seemed that he was often absent from his bed, and that the creaking of his floor at certain hours of the night was remarked by the man in the room below. This fellow also spoke of hearing the tread of shod feet in the night. But Gilman was sure he must have been mistaken in this, since shoes as well as other apparel were always precisely in place in the morning. One could develop all sorts of aural delusions in this morbid old house, for did not Gilman himself, even in daylight, now feel certain that noises other than rat scratching came from the black voids beyond the slanting wall and above the slanting ceiling. His pathologically sensitive ears began to listen for faint footfalls in the immemorially sealed loft overhead, and sometimes the illusion of such things was agonizingly realistic. However, he knew that he had actually become a somnambulist, for twice at night his room had been found vacant, though with all his clothing in place. Of this he had been assured by Frank Elwood, the one fellow student whose poverty forced him to room in this squalid and unpopular house. Elwood had been studying in the small hours and had come up for help on a differential equation, only to find Gilman absent. It had been rather presumptuous of him to open the unlocked door after knocking had failed to rouse a response, but he had needed the help very badly, and thought that his host would not mind a gentle prodding awake. On neither occasion, though, had Gilman been there, 
and when told of the matter he wondered where he could have been wandering, barefoot and with only his night clothes on. He resolved to investigate the matter if reports of his sleepwalking continued, and thought of sprinkling flour on the floor of the corridor to see where his footsteps might lead. The door was the only conceivable egress, for there was no possible foothold outside the narrow window. As April advanced, Gilman's fever-sharpened ears were disturbed by the whining prayers of a superstitious loom-fixer named Joe Mazurowicz, who had a room on the ground floor. Mazurowicz had told long, rambling stories about the ghost of old Keziah and the furry, sharp-fanged, nuzzling thing, and had said he was so badly haunted at times that only his silver crucifix, given him for the purpose by Father Iwaniki, of St. Stanislaus Church could bring him relief. Now he was praying because the witch's Sabbath was drawing near. May Eve was Valpurgis night, when hell's blackest evil roamed the earth, and all the slaves of Satan gathered for the nameless rites and deeds. It was always a very bad time in Arkham even though the fine folks up in Miskatonic Avenue and high and salt and stall streets pretended to know nothing about it. There would be bad doings, and a child or two would probably be missing. Joe knew about such things, for his grandmother in the old country had heard tales from her grandmother. It was wise to pray and count one's beads at this season. For three months, Keziah and Brown Jenkin had not been near Joe's room, nor near Paul Choinsky's room, nor anywhere else, and it meant no good when they held off like that. They must be up to something. Gilman dropped in at the doctor's office on the 16th of the month, and was surprised to find his temperature was not as high as he had feared. The physician questioned him sharply and advised him to see a nerve specialist, On reflection, he was glad he had not consulted the still more inquisitive college doctor. Old Waldron, who had curtailed his activities before, would have made him take a rest, an impossible thing now that he was so close to great results in his equations. He was certainly near the boundary between the known universe and the fourth dimension, and who could say how much farther he might go. But even as these thoughts came to him, he wondered at the source of his strange confidence. Did all of this perilous sense of imminence come from the formulae on the sheets he covered day by day? The soft, stealthy, imaginary footsteps in the sealed loft above were unnerving, and now, too, there was a growing feeling that somebody was constantly persuading him to do something terrible which he could not do. How about the somnambulism? Where did he go sometimes in the night? And what was that faint suggestion of sound which once in a while seemed to trickle through the confusion of identifiable sounds, even in broad daylight and full wakefulness? Its rhythm did not correspond to anything on earth. Unless perhaps to the cadence of one or two unmentionable Sabbat chants and sometimes he feared it corresponded to certain attributes of the vague shrieking or roaring in those holy alien abysses of dream. The dreams were meanwhile getting to be atrocious. In the lighter preliminary phase, the evil old woman was now of fiendish distinctness, and Gilman knew she was the one who had frightened him in the slums. Her bent back, long nose, and shriveled chin were unmistakable, and her shapeless brown garments were like those he remembered. The expression on her face was one of hideous malevolence and exultation, and when he awakened he could recall a croaking voice that persuaded and threatened. He must meet the black man and go with them all to the throne of Azathoth at the center of ultimate chaos. That was what she said. He must sign the Book of Azathoth in his own blood and take a new secret name now that his independent dwellings had gone so far. What kept him from going with her and Brown Jenkin and the other to the throne of chaos 
where the thin flutes pipe mindlessly was the fact that he had seen the name Azathoth in the Necronomicon and knew it stood for a primal evil, too horrible for description. The old woman always appeared out of thin air near the corner where the downward slant met the inward slant. She seemed to crystallize at a point closer to the ceiling than to the floor, and every night she was a little nearer and more distinct before the dream shifted. Brown Jenkin, too, was always a little nearer at the last, and its yellowish-white fangs glistened shockingly in that unearthly violet phosphorescence. Its shrill, loathsome tittering struck more and more into Gilman's head, and he could remember in the morning how it had pronounced the words Azathoth and Nyarlathotep. In the deeper dreams, everything was likewise more distinct, and Gilman felt that the twilight abysses around him were those of the fourth dimension, those organic entities whose motions seemed least flagrantly irrelevant and unmotivated, were probably projections of life forms from our own planet, including human beings. What the others were in their own dimensional sphere or spheres he dared not try to think. Two of the less irrelevantly moving things, a rather large congeries of iridescent, prolately spheroidal bubbles, and a very much smaller polyhedron of unknown colors and rapidly shifting surface angles seemed to take notice of him and follow him about or float ahead as he changed position among the titan prisms, labyrinths, cube and plane clusters and quasi-buildings and all the while the vague shrieking and roaring waxed louder and louder as if approaching some monstrous climax of utterly unendurable intensity. Tonight's story was written by H.P. Lovecraft. The Dread Familiar was created by Joel Hackett. Thanks for listening. Good night.